Good day everyone, especially to our instructor, Sir Eugene Padino. Ang among report karon is ang Lesson 9 and 10, which is post-war period and new colonialism in the Philippines, and historical interpretation. Lesson 9, post-war period and new colonialism in the Philippines. What is new colonialism? New colonialism, the control of least developed countries by developed countries through indirect means of political, economic, or cultural pressure instead of military control. On July 4, 1946 is the date when the Philippines became an independent country from the America. Philippines didn't consider it and is still reminded under in America and its favor for America. There are three primary sources that use in painting the pictures of Philippines during this period. The first document is a declassified U.S. Central Intelligence Agency file that reports the condition in the Philippines in the year 1950. The second is an article published in the magazine called the Philippine Free Press about the 1953 presidential election. And the last one is the speech delivered by former President Corazon Aquino before the U.S. Congress in September 1985. After the World War II, in this period, the two strongest and most powerful nation state in the world were vying for world supremacy were engaging in a diplomatic contest. The United States and the USSR were suspecting each other of an agenda to dominate the world. Pagkahuman sa World War II o ginatawag nato na post-war, gisundan dayon siya og Cold War. Because of the two strongest and most powerful nation, which is the USSR and United States. So, what is Cold War? Cold War, the period of non-war rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States and their respective allies from 1947 to 1991. Luyo Ani, sa Pilipinas pod, is si Luis Tarok kay total siya sa Bill Trade Act, Parity and Minden to the Constitution of Military Base Agreement. Si Luis Tarok, isa ni siya ka leader sa isa ka hukbo, uh, ginatawag nga hook or hook balahap. Ang hook balahap is kuha na siya, hukbong bayan laban sa mga hapon. Kaning nga hukbo, daw kay ninatabang sa Pilipinas. Kay kaning hukbong bayan laban sa mga Hapon, isa po ni sila sa nagpalaya sa mga Hapon sa panahon sa World War II. Pagkahuman sa World War II, si Luis Taro kay tutol siya sa Bill Trade Act, Parity Amendment to the Constitution o Military Base Agreement. Kay kani siya, pabor man siya sa Amerika. Tapos, dili dawat sa mga hukbalahap ang pamumuno ng mga Amerikano sa Pilipinas kay layunin nila na lubos na kalayaan sa mga dayuhan. Tapos kato nga panahon, ang ato ang guberno sa Pilipinas is dikit siya sa Amerika. Maong ang katong hukbalahap, gi kalaban siya sa ato ang guberno. Tungod ato, ang hukbalahap is gituring na sa ato ang guberno nga isa siya ka rebelyon. Tungod sa kakusog sa pwersa sa mga hukbalahap, Mismo ang guberno sa Pilipinas maglisod nagpugong sa mismong hukbo. Nya kay Cold War man to nga panahon, nahadlok ang US nga basig ang maghari sa Pilipinas is ay ang mga hukbalahap. Kay kung mahitabo to, basig mawala sa balansi ang Amerika. Maong ang US, nakialam na siya sa laban para pildihon ang mga hukbalahap. Pero maglisod yapon sila tungod sa kusog sa pwersa sa hukbalahap. Pero, katong pagkadaong nila mong magsaysay, nihinay na pod ang pwersa sa Hawk Balahap. Tapos, nakahimo na pod ang plano ang CIA o Central Intelligence Agency kung saan pagpildi ang Hawk Balahap. Ang nakaplano kung saan pagpildi ang Hawk Balahap kay si Edward Lansdale. Nigamit og aswang si Edward Lansdale para pildihon ang mga Hawk Balahap. Pero, dili literal ng aswang ang iyang gamit. Kibali, nagpakalat rin siya istorya-istorya nga ang katong gi hulupan sa hook balahap kay na ito'y mga aswang ug kabalo si Edward Lansdale nga dili basta-basta mo surrender ang hook balahap sa panghadlok lang so ang sunod na iyahang gimo is kadtong ilang nadakpan nga membro sa hook balahap ilang gibangagan og duha ka bangag sa liog vampire passion tapos pagkahuman nila og bangag ilahang ibitay nga pabaliktad para mahutdan og dugo pagkahuman 
ilang gibutang ang patay nga lawas sa agihanan og pagbalik sa Hukbalhap nakita nila ang patay nga lawas sa ilang kauban nga wa na idugo og didto sila nakauna-una nga dili lang day guberno ang ilang kalaban apil na puday ang mga aswang tungod sa pangitabo ang Hukbalhap kay pabalin-balin na sila og lugar para dili sila mabiktima sa aswang Mautong ginautro-utro gihapon sa CIA ang ilahang strategy kung saan la pagpildi ang Hukbalahap. On May 17, 1954, ni surrender na ang Supremo nga si Luis Tarok sa guberno sa Pilipinas. Kaning Hukbalahap, bisan pag ikalaban sila sa guberno, dili gihapon ta makaingon na kalaban ta nila kay ilahang ambag sa Pilipinas ang kalayaan nato sa mga hapon. Ang kalayaan na nasa ato karon. Leon o Thais, it's up to you now and the magsaysay myth. Ramon Magsaysay as the people's president, his humble beginnings and educational background were placed in stark contrast to his predecessors. Indeed, the president before him were all lawyers who came from the old blended elite families and were prominent figures in Philippine politics for many generations of the American period. Magsaysay was became a governor of Zambales, elected as a legislator and was appointed as a secretary of national defense under President Carino as defense secretary. Magsaysay was painted as a self-made president who rose from the rocks of the masses through sheer ability and patriotism. He was celebrated as an anti-communist hero who broke the growing momentum of the Hawk Rebellion as a defense secretary. Journalist Leon Otay penned an article which is It's Up to You Now for the Philippine Free Press three days before the November 1953 presidential election. And the article illustrates of Magsaysay's portrayal in the press. The article started with an anecdote where Defense Secretary Magsaysay called a newsman to express his worries in the way things were run in the Carina cabinet. Leo Thais right have craftily narrated the history of Magsaysay's political career from his days as a war veteran to his days as the defense secretary until he resigned from the Carino cabinet and immediately transferred from the Liberal Party to the Nationalista Party where was defeated as the standard bearer. The article also described the confidence of hardcore nationalists to Magsaysay. This include Josipe Laurel, Claro, M. Recto, and Lorenzo Tanyada. According to Tai, was how the nationalist leaders such as Laurel showed patriotism. Picture of the liberal regime in the Philippines for the past eight years. Analysis of Philippine Free Press Speech for Magsaysay Magsaysay's campaign was a staggering success. For the first time in the history of elections in the Philippines, the president won a landslide victory. Magsaysay defeated Liberal Party's standard bearer and incumbent Philippine President of Pedro Carino with 68.9% ballots cast electing Magsaysay as president. However, the Magsaysay's presidential campaign was appraised by many historians like Stephen Shalom, William Pomeroy, and Renato Constantino as a U.S. project. Indeed, Magsaysay was avidly supported by the U.S. government, U.S. media such as Time and Reader's Digest created fantastic myths about his humble begins. They painted him as a fierce anti-communist and relentless reformer for the Cora Philippine state and a loyal supporter of the United States. The CIA was behind Magsaysay's campaign. They choreographed how the media would portray him. The very image that Lansdale wanted from Magsaysay was well captured by the Philippine Free Press article summarized previously. Tai wrote about Magsaysay's rise from the masses and painted him as a humble and patriotic politician who despaired with what he witnessed in the Carina government. 
the unconcealed and historically documented support of the United States to Magsaysay's presidency is another indicator of the continued and unrivaled U.S. influence on the Philippines' national affairs. Years after the official end of U.S. colonization, Magsaysay is just a representation of how Philippine presidents of the post-war period continuously lead the country according to the framework set by the United States. Today, I am going to talk about revisiting Corazon Aquino's speech before the U.S. Congress. Before we start, who is Corazon Aquino? Maria Corazon Cori Cuanco Aquino, born in January 25, 1933, the first woman who became the 11th President of the Philippines from 1896 to 1992, and also the wife of Benigno Aquino Jr. Maria Corazon Aquino restored the democracy after the long dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos. Her image as a mourning widowed housewife who has always been in the shadow of her husband and relatives and had no experience in politics. September 18, 1986, seven months after Cory became president, she went to the United States and spoke before the joint session of the U.S. Congress. She was welcomed with long applause as she took the podium and addressed the United States about her presidency and the challenge faced by the new republic. At that time, Cory's presidency was standing on an unstable ground. The economic situation she inherited was in shambles. Hindi gaano katibay at kaunlad ang Pilipinas noong iniwan ni Ferdinand Marcos. She also shared about how his husband died and how she encouraged the Filipino people to fight against Marcos' dictatorship. She talked of the three times that they lost Ninoy. The first time was when the dictatorship detained Ninoy. Cory continued that when Ninoy survived the first detention, he was charged of subversion, murder, and other crimes. Ninoy decided to do a hunger strike and fast for 40 days. Cory treated this event as the second time that their family lost Ninoy. Cory attributes the peaceful Edsa revolution to the martyrdom of Ninoy. Cory talked about her miraculous victory through the people's struggle and continued talking about her earliest initiatives as the president of a restored democracy. Cory emphasized the importance of the Edsa revolution in terms of being a limited revolution that respects the life and freedom of every Filipino. Cory then presented her peace agenda with the existing communist insurgency aggravated by the dictatorial and authoritarian. Cory's peace agenda involved political initiatives and reintegration programs to persuade insurgents to leave the countryside and return to mainstream society and participate in the restoration of democracy. She noted that similar to Abraham Lincoln, she understood that force may be necessary before mercy. While she did not relish the idea, she will do whatever it takes to defend the integrity and freedom of her country. Cory then turned to the controversial topic of the Philippine foreign debt amounting to $26 billion at the time of her speech. Ito ang utang na naiwan ng mga Marcoses. She even remarked on the peaceful character of the EDSA People Power Revolution, ours must has been the cheapest revolution ever. She continued that while the country has experienced the calamities brought about by the corrupt dictatorship of Marcos, no commensurate assistance was yet extended to the Philippines. Condition of the debt negotiation which was the restoration of democracy and responsible government. Cory stated that kahit saan siya pumunta, nakakita siya ng mga Filipino na walang trabaho at mahihirap. At sila ay pumupunta kay Cory at umiiyak para sa democracy. Cory proceed to enumerate the challenges of the Filipino people as they tried to build the new democracy. This were the persisting communist insurgency and economic deterioration. Finally, Cory ended her speech by thanking the United States for serving as home to her family, for what she referred to as the three happiest years of their lives together. 
She urged the United States to build the Philippines as a new home for democracy and turning the, the country as a shining testament of our two nations' commitment to freedom. Sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas, ang labanan sa magtan ay isa sa mga pinakamabuluhang kaganapan na nangyari. Ipinakita din nito kung paano ang mga Pilipino walang takot sa pakikipaglaban sa mga dayuhan na nasakop ang bansa. Tinulungan ng mga Pilipino ang isa, isa pa sa pagtatanggol sa kanilang bansa mula sa mananakop. At sila pula po ang siyang nagpinatay si Magellan. Dahil dyan, sila pula po ay tinuring ang unang bayaning Pilipino sa Pilipinas. The immediate cause of battle was Zola. Ang agarang dahilan ng labanan ay si Zola, isa sa mga hipe nagmula sa Mactan. Nagsabing hindi niya na ipadala ang buto ng kanyang tribute kay Magellan dahil kay Lapu-Lapu. Hindiling ni Zula sa mga Europeo na tumulong or to fight or to fight against to Lapu-Lapu at agad na nagpasya si Magellan na personal na pamunuan ang maliit niyang pwersang ito or ang kanyang mga sundalo. Sa kabila ng mga protesta ng kanyang mga tauhan ay nagpatuloy siya or sila sa salaysay na ito ni Pigafita nakita natin ang pagtatangka ni Magellan na bigyan ng pagkakataon ang mga pwersa nila Pulapo na sumuko bago pa man mangyari ang labanan sa pamagitan ng isang lokal na pangangalakal na muslim bilang interpreter ang mga partido ng labanan ay nakipagpalitan ng mga barbs tungkol sa kanilang armas ang mga islander ay nagnanais na bitag ang mga pwersa ni Magellan sa pamamagitan ng pag-akit sa kanila na umataki habang madilim pa ngunit nakita ng mga Europeo ang kanilang mga intensyon ang account na binigay ni Figapita sa talatang ito ay nagitali ng mahalagang impormasyon tungkol sa labanan sila ay tumatawid sa tubig na hanggang hita nasuot ang kanilang mabibigat na metal na balote at sandata. Maaaring na naapiktuhan ng sitwasyon ito ang kanilang leksi. Ang matingkad na kawalan ng balanse sa pagitan ng dalawang panik ay maliwanag din. Pinamunuan ni Magellan ang kanyang tropa na apat na potensyam na tawan upang harapin ang 1,500 na anas pwersa nila Pulapo. Inilalawan din ang mga armas at estilo ng pakikipaglaban ng mandrigmang maktan. April 27, 1521, kung saan naganap ang labanan sa Mactan. Nagpadala ng ilang tauhan si Magellan upang sinugin ang mga bahay ng katutubong mandirigma. Imbis na matakot ay ito pa pala ang magiging sanhi ng galit at sobrang bangis. Ang mandirigma ng Mactan ay gumamit ng sibat, bato at palaso na may lason. The captain had his right leg first by a poison arrow na kung saan nagbigay siya ng utos na umatras ang iba ay umatas agad. Kakaunti na lang natira na tropes ni Magellan. Ang kanilang mga kanyan ay nasa barko, hindi aabot kasi mababaw ang tubig. The enemies seeing this all rush against him, and one of them with a great sword gave him a great blow on the left leg na kung saan tinamaan si Magellan sa kaliwang hita at ito ay natumba. Pinatay siya ng katutubong mandirigma ng Mactan. The Battle of Mactan was oversimplified. Based on the evidence, Lapu-Lapu was not the young warrior we imagined him to be, and he did not personally kill Magellan. The battle was one of the Mactan's warriors, whose strategy and sheer number easily defeated the Europeans. Noong April 27, 1521, ay minarkahan ang tanyag na labanan sa Mactan. Ito ang unang na italang tagumpay ng katutubong sandata. Laban sa mga dayuhang mananakop, ito ang kauna-unahang pambansang kaganapan na may walang hanggang aral na ang mga taong hindi natakot na lumaban at mamatay para sa kanilang klayan ay karapat-dapat na lumaya. Yan ang sinabi ni Lapu-Lapu, which is na-inspire ako. 
The importance of my assigned topic as a student and to make a criminology student I encourage in every battle we encounter in our life. We must fight for our dreams. In terms of studies, always remember, poverty is not a hindrance to be success. Use your situation right now to inspire. Keep chasing your dreams. Don't give up. First Catholic Mass in the Philippines Pinaniniwalaang sa butuan ang unang misa sa loob ng tatlong siglo na nagtapos sa pagtatayo ng monumento noong 1872 malapit sa ilog ng Agusan. Ang pagdating ng ekspedisyon at pagdidiriwang noong April 8, 1521. Karaniwang tinutukoy ng mga mananalaysay ang dalawang pangunahing pinagmumulan sa pagtukoy sa lugar ng unang misa. Ang isa ay ang lag ni Francisco Albo, isang piloto ng isa sa mga barko ni Magellan. Isa siya sa 18 survivors na bumalik kasama si Sebastian Elcano sakay ng Visal Victoria pagkatapos nilang libutin ang mundo. Ang isa pa at ang mas kumpleto ay ang account ni Antonio Pigafetta. Si Pigafetta tulad ni Francisco Albo ay membro ng ekspedisyon ni Magellan at isang saksi sa mga kaganapan particular sa unang misa. 16th of March, 1521, as they sailed in a westerly course from Ladrones, they saw land towards the northwest, but owing to many shallow places, they did not approach it. They found later that its name was Yunagan. They went instead that same day southwards to another small island named Suluan, and there they anchored. There they saw some canoes, but this fled at the Spaniards' approach. This island was at 9 and 2 thirds degrees north latitude. Departing from those two islands, they sailed westward to an inhabited island of Gada, where they took in a supply of wood and water. From that island, they sailed westward towards a large island named Sailani that was inhabited and was known to have gold. Sailing southwards, they turned southwest to a small island called Mazava. The people of that island of Mazava, there are Spaniards planted across upon a mountain top. They sailed again towards Sailani, northwesterly direction. They saw three small islands. There they entered channel between two islands which was called Matan and the other Subu. And anchored at the town La Villa of Subo, where they stayed many days and obtained provisions and entered into a peace pact with the local king. The town of Subo was on an east-west with the island of Suluan and Mazava, but between Mazava and Subo, there were so many shallows that the boat could not go westward. Sa salaysay ni Albo, ang lokasyon ng Mazava ay akma sa isla ng Limasawa. Sa katimugang dulo ng Leyte, 9 degrees 54 minutes sa Hilaga. Gayun din, hindi binanggit ni Albo ang unang misa. Ngunit ang pagtatanim lamang ng cross sa tuktok ng mundok kung saan makikita ang tatlong isla sa kanluran at timog kanluran na akma rin sa katimugang dulo ng Limasawa. In the year 1521, March 16, Magellan's crew landed on Jamal. On the following day, March 17, they landed on the island named Humonhon. On that same day, Magellan named the entire archipelago Island of St. Lazarus. It was Sunday in the Lenten season when the gospel assigned for the Mass. On the next day, March 18, exchange of gifts between Magellan and nine men. March 17, Magellan renamed the island of Humonhon, the watering place of Good Omen. Magellan's expedition lasted eight days in Humonhon. From March 17 to March 25, in the afternoon of March 25, the expedition left the island of Humonhon. It is, it is also the feast of the Annunciation. On this day, Pigafetta fell into the water, but was rescued. March 25, from the day they left Humonhon, they sailed westward towards Leyte, then southward passing the island of Hibuson and Hinuangan Bay, then westward to Mazawa Island. March 28, Holy Thursday until April 4, they renamed in the island of Mazawa for seven days. April 4 to April 7, they left Mazawa and bound to Gatighan Cebu. They sailed westward to Camotes Group Islands. From there, the Spanish waited for the Mazawa's king. 
after that they sailed towards Cebu. April 7, they reached Cebu. Gafeta's Evidences March 28 was the Holy Thursday. Magellan stayed at Mazao Island, saying that it is Holy Thursday and they stayed there for seven days. There is a big possibility that they had a Mass on Easter Sunday, March 31. Thursday, March 28, Holy Thursday. What happened here is that Magellan and his company exchanged gifts with the natives. And on the same day that afternoon, he anchored New Native King's Village. The second day is Holy Friday. Another exchange of gifts was made where the Indian Native King brought two members of Magellan Expedition as guests for the night. One of the two is Pigafetta. So as guest of the Native Kings, Pigafetta and his companions spent the previous evening feasting and drinking with the kings and his son. The third day, the following morning on Saturday, Pigafetta and his company took leave of their host and returned to the ships. In the early morning of Sunday, March 31, the first Mass was celebrated and in that afternoon, they planted a cross on the summit of the highest hill, which was both attended by the King of Mazua and the King of Butuan. On Monday, April 1, Magellan sent men assured to help with the harvest in exchange of Mazua's kings help to conduct Magellan to Subo. But now we're closed down because the two kings were sleeping of their drinking about night before. It is only in April 2 on Tuesday and Wednesday when work on the harvest initiated. On April 4, Thursday, Magellan and company leave Mazua bound for sea. So, according to primary sources available, a crucial aspect of Butuan River was not mentioned. Butuan is a river and settlement situated on the Agusan River. Today, we're going to talk about Rizal's retraction. But before that, we're going to talk about who is Jose Rizal. Jose Rizal, in full, Jose Portagio Rizal Mercado Y. Alonso, Rialonda, was a Filipino nationalist, writer, and polymath active at the end of the Spanish colonial period of the Philippines. He is considered the national hero of the Philippines. He was born on June 19, 1861 in Calamba, Philippines, and died on December 30, 1896 in Manila, Philippines, at the age of 35. Rizal's Retraction Jose Rizal is identified as a hero of revolution for his writing that centered on ending colonialism and liberating Filipino minds to contribute creating the Filipino nation. The great volume of Rizal's life work was committed to this end, particularly the more influential ones, No Limitangere and El Flubesterismo. His essays vilified not the Catholic religion, but the friars, the primary agent of injustice in the Philippine society. It is understandable, therefore, that any piece of writing from Rizal that reckons everything he has written against the friars and the Catholic Church in the Philippines could deal substantial damage to his image as a prominent Filipino revolutionary. Such a document purportedly exists allegedly signed by Rizal a few hours before his execution. This document referred to as the retraction, declares Rizal's belief in the Catholic faith and retract everything he has written against the church. This was the translation of Rizal's retraction found by Father Manuel Garcia. I declare myself a Catholic and in this religion in which I was born and educated, I wish to live and die. I retract with all my heart whatever in my words, writings, publication, and conduct has been contrary to my character as a son of the Catholic Church. I believe and I confess whatever she teach and I submit whatever she demands. I abominate masonry as the enemy which is of the Church and as a society prohibited by the church. The diocesan prelate may, as a superior ecclesiastical authority, make a public this spontaneous manifestation of mine in order to repair the scandal which my act may have caused and so that God and people may pardon me.
This was written on December 29, 1896 by Sarsal. There are several iterations of the text of this retraction. The first was published in La Voz Española and Jario de Manila on the day of the execution, December 30, 1896. The second text appeared in Barcelona, Spain, in the magazine La Juventud, a few months after the execution, February 14, 1897, from an anonymous writer who was later on revealed to be Father Vicente Balaguer. However, the original text was only found in the Arc Diocesan archive on May 18, 1935, after almost four decades of disappearance. There are doubts on the retraction document aban, primarily because only one eyewitness account of the writing of the document exists, that of the Jesuit friar Father Vicente Balaguer. He claimed he was the one who assisted Rizal most of the sad days, hours, and even argued with him and demolished his argument. According to his testimony, Rizal woke up several times, confessed four times, attended a mass, received communion, and prayed the rosary, all of which seems out of character. But since it is the only testimony of allegedly a primary account that Rizal ever wrote, a retraction document. It has been used to argue the authenticity of the document. Another eyewitness account surfaced in the last decade among the 1,000 reports found in Cuerpo de Vigilancia collection published in 2011. Around 30 are about Rizal, and eight of this report can shed light on the retraction controversy. One is a surveillance report on the last hour of Rizal written by Federico Moreno. The retraction of Rizal remained to this day a controversy. Many scholars, however, agreed that the document not furnish the heroism of Rizal. His relevance remained solidified to Filipinos and pushed them to continue the revolution, which eventually resulted in independence in 1898.